Okay, so welcome to, I think this is the eighth lecture, although I'm, I'm starting to lose count, in this year's Science and Cooking Lecture Series. And we're really honored to have with us um, Martin Breslin, who's the um, chef for Harvard, for HUDS, for Harvard. And we also have Alex and Luis. Um, and um, we're really honored to have them with us. We've been doing this at Harvard for many years, and we finally get to have Harvard's chefs talk in this series. And so I guess I'd just like to start by clapping for them. And actually, so what they're going to illustrate for us today is really one of the most fascinating parts of cooking, I think, which is the science of texture, how it is that you actually thicken sauces and what is the science behind that. And OK, so now just to introduce the science of this, I wanted to start by showing you um, the lab that we're doing um, actually right now, uh, not starting on Thursday um, in the Harvard College class. Are we doing it right now? We're doing it right now. The lab that we're doing right now in the Harvard College class that goes along with this lecture that the chefs are about to give us. And this is a sort of funny lab. It's called Macaroni and Cheese. Is that we have the students, and it's in the lab. It's in one of the labs over there, um, in one of the science labs. They make macaroni and cheese. And what we ask them to do is a bit strange, um, which is that we ask them to make four different varieties of macaroni and cheese. You see, we ask them to make it with all of these different things. And then we ask them to measure what we call the viscosity, which is the scientific term that basically goes um, with thickeners, which is sort of when you say a, a sauce is thickening, then what the scientists would say is, well, it's more viscous. And we ask them to measure the viscosity. And in order to demonstrate that this viscosity, this is actually sort of how thick it feels in your mouth, but it also has culinary significance in different ways. And the method that we use for them to measure measure the viscosity is, well, I was going to call it brilliant, but that's probably overstating it, um, is, is this. Is what we do is we tell them to take a, 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 um, a cup full of macaroni and then to pour the, the, the sauce on top of it and to basically measure how quickly the sauce covers the macaroni, which is, of course, measuring how quickly, the, um, the, how easily it flows. Now, in this room in past years, when we've discussed viscosity, we've even brought with us scientific pieces of equipment that are very fancy, that are going to the name of rheometers, that basically measure the viscous properties of liquids. Um, and they're very esoteric, and they're things that like Pia and I and Dave <laughs> like, but that most people don't like. And it's really less relevant. This is really the key experiment. Actually, this picture was taken from last year's Harvard X class. Um, if you took the Harvard X class, you also got to do this lab. Um, and um, here are some pictures. Um, from the Harvard X class. But what I want to do um, at the moment is to ask the question, which I think will underlie this entire lecture, which is why is it that some of these sauces spread um, so much more easily than others? That is, what is it about the way that they're make, made that makes them something viscous and others not? And if you want to think about the least viscous thing that I can imagine, it's basically water. So water is the least viscous thing. And you can imagine, if you took water and you poured it down this column of macaroni, what would happen? It would just go right to the bottom, right? It would go very quickly and go right to the bottom. And this whole art of thickening sauces that we're about to see is really about making that not happen and is somehow making it fall slowly. So what is going on? OK, so what is viscosity? So I already said this. That's the thickness of the liquid, a liquid's um, resistance to flow. Sort of on the other side of the scale, from viscous water is the, is the, has the lowest viscosity. Honey, of course, has a very high viscosity. It, it basically falls very slowly. But even another cooking material that, that also has a high viscosity, which you may not think of this way, is dough. Because after all, if you take a ball of dough and you put it on the, on the table and we waited until the end of the lecture, it would have spread out and flattened even more slowly than honey would. And so what is going on? So what is the molecular origin of this? So these two pictures, actually, we... Um, we got from Nathan Mirvold, who um, has um, put together some of the videos for the Harvard X version of the class, who had what I think is a brilliant analogy of what's going on. And I'm going to tell it to you. And when you watch these guys, if you want a scientific analogy in the back of your head, I recommend this one. So what Nathan said is, imagine that you're, you're going to the subway. Right, and you're going, and you know, you, and imagine you go during an, a time, you know, on the weekend. There aren't many people there, and you go from the, you know, the place where you give your ticket to the train, and you just walk very quickly. And there's no problem. We all could walk very quickly. There's no problem to get um, to the train. So that's not viscous because we move very quickly. So on the other hand, imagine a situation which is like this, where the subway car is full of people. Right? There are lots of people there. Then it's very slow. You could still flow. We could be moving. But you know when you're driving? Do any of you have this problem? You're driving down the road, and the, the idiot in front of you isn't going fast enough? 
Maybe it's just me. I'm the one behind you that's honking. Um, um, you, 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 you know, and you're always like, well, why is this? Like, don't they know how to drive? Uh, maybe, none of, maybe it's just me who, who does this. And, and in reality, what's happening is, is that the poor person has this set of people in front of them, and they're, they're blocking it, and that's viscosity. So, what is, so the message is, and when these guys are making sauces that are thick, what they're doing is they're adding stuff to impede mo movement. They're making it, the packing fraction big. That's what we're going to say. You're just putting stuff in there to make it so that it doesn't move. Okay, so then, of course, you know, and also from this example, you also know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Certainly, you've experienced it while driving, is if you pack enough people in the roadway, you stop. Has anyone noticed that? Okay, so does anybody know? So, okay, here's a question for you. This is going to sound like a crazy question, and we didn't bring them. Does anybody have some M&Ms? No M&Ms. So... No M&M. So suppose you took a jar of M&Ms, right? And you just shook it. The M&Ms stop. They're not flowing. Does anyone know what fraction of the jar is filled with M&Ms? This actually is a good for the kids in the audience, if there are any kids, you, or even the grown-ups. If you want to help your child win an M&M candy counting contest, this is the number you need to know. I mean, the question is, what fraction of the jar is filled with M&Ms? Does anybody know? Is it 50%? You know, there's air in the jar. I don't know if you notice this. So it turns out there's a magic number. It's about 65%. That, that's, that's the fraction. So basically, if you ever get the volume fraction of the, of the stuff up to 65%, it stops. If, you get it, if it's like 30%, it doesn't matter. It'll flow easily. You might as well not put anything in at all. So there's this magic range at about 50 60%, and that's where you want to get to. And these guys, and all of these sauces they're going to make, what you're going to see is what they're doing is they're getting the fraction up to around that range. So this is a movie of molecules um, flowing over each other. So see, they don't run into each other. So the, the viscosity is actually, there's no problem here. But on the other hand, if you do with the sort of simplest kind of a sauce that you can imagine is a starch thickened sauce. And if you, um, and we'll see a starch thickened sauce now. Now, if you put starch um, granules into a liquid, you can put them, so there's this weird thing that happens. You can put them at a pretty low concentration, a low volume fraction is what we will say, because sort of there's a lot of free space here for these things to move. If you imagine these as people in the subway car, they're not running into each other. But then the point is, when you heat it, they swell. And not only do they swell, they excrude, excrete stuff. They swell and they excrete stuff. And then what happens is they end up like this. And if you imagine that this is people in the subway car, then you see now it doesn't move so easily. And that's basically what it means. This is the crux of what it means to thicken a, a sauce. And I have a little movie of this, courtesy of Harvard X. Um, you see the... Um, they, they, so basically, and they also can stick to each other. Not do they grow, they stick to each other. And now if they stick to each other, they even become bigger people. So if you imagine the analogy in the subway car, imagine that there are groups of people that decide to join hands and pummel through, right? That's, then you're going to get mad if you're the poor person walking. You're even making it harder to get through. And that's exactly what happens when you make um, sauces, as we're seeing. And so this brings up, which is the equation of this week. Now, what are you supposed to do for the equation of the week? Just a clap. So anyway, but this is the equation, and it's a very simple equation, and this captures the whole idea of thickening sauces, which is it's the volume fraction. For some reason, we call it phi, Greek letters, just to make it sound complicated. But it's just the number of particles times the volume of each particle divided by the total volume. And basically, the game is when that number gets to be a 50 60%, you're good. You thickened your sauce. Okay, so now I have one more thing to say. I, I do have one more thing to say, sorry. I, I, but I think this is important for what you're going to do, and I just want to... Um, so, you know, when you add flour, has anyone ever thickened gravy? I mean, how much flour do you add? A lot? A little? A little, because it swells, right? That's why you don't have to add very much, because it swells. So has anyone ever thickened, um, you know, sort of made something more viscous by adding, like, a, like xanthan gum or some modernist thickener? Do you know how much you need? Teeny, teeny, teeny. teeny. Do you know how much of the Jello box is gelatin? Yeah, it's very, very, the most of that jello box, you know what the main ingredient is in the jello box? Sugar, it's sugar. It's not, it's jello. So, so this is amazing, actually, because if you think of this in terms of volume fraction, this is totally weird, because you add this little bit of this stuff into this big amount of liquid, and it comes out, and, and like if we go back to the subway cars, how does it work? So the, the answer is that, um, that what happens is that, that these special molecules are polymers, and the weight is, and there's not very much polymer, but the polymer basically forms a path in space which creates a lot of volume. And so it actually takes up a lot of volume even though it's just a little polymer. In the same way that the starch granule 
it, it expands and it takes up much more volume than it had originally, the polymer sort of sweeps it out and takes up that much volume. And that's why modernist thickeners are able to work and make thick milkshake feeling things with, with a little bit of additive. Okay, so with that, um, I guess I would like to introduce Martin and Alex and Louise, um, who will tell us how this is really done. Excellent. So let's think. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Chef Luis Picasta, he's in charge of our commissary, where all the, the soup and sauces are produced. So viscosity is very important when we're producing uh, large quantities of soups and sauces. And uh, Chef Alex takes care of Mather House students. So we you know, work for, the, uh, for Harvard and primarily support the undergraduate uh, program. So a history of thickening, of thickeners, right? when you, it was very interesting when I was looking at this from a food historical uh, perspective. So the word sauce is a French word, and it means to make our food appetizing. Sounds good. So go back 2,000 years ago, um, the first real recorded recipes were from the Roman Empire, um, and it was espiscus, if I'm pronouncing that correct. But in one of his recipes, he actually said, um, Recipes for a particular flavorsome sauce is noted that no one at the table will know what they are eating. The sauces were usually thickened with wheat flour or crumbled pastry. Honey was often added, and the reason was the Romans often used sauces to conceal doubtful freshness. <laughs> so in, ha in truth, it really, the French were right. It does make the food taste better. It can make really bad food taste better. So we've got to ask ourselves. So that's actually Pompeii, and they're the ovens in Pompeii. And it's pretty cool because if you've ever been there, they're all communal kitchens, which is pretty amazing, and uh, bakeries, and very much like a, a retail concept. Very few people cook at home. So why do we thicken? Would uh, anyone like to give some suggestions to why we thicken our food? Huh? Mouthfeel. So mouthfeel is the number one reason why we thicken our food. And that's important. Because we, you know, if you're, if you're taking a, tasting a clear broth, it's going to taste, you're going to get a very different experience if you thicken, even just thicken that broth and do nothing else. Um, another one, of course, is cling. So when you're putting a sauce on food, you want it to cling to the food. You don't want it to run off the food. Could you imagine a steak au pav that wasn't thickened? So cling is very important, um, keeping sauces on the plate. And, of course, then we have particle suspension, hold solids and prevents sticking or floating, and stabilize emulsions when you're talking about salad dressings and so on. So they're the real main. There are, I'm sure, more reasons, but that's the most important reasons why we thicken our food. Um, the thickening process, dispersion, hydration, and setting. So when we're adding a thickening agent, we want to make sure it's evenly dis dis uh, distributed throughout the liquid. We could use heat, cold, acid, or other liquids, depending on what you're using to thicken the food. Um, so, and then hydration. You want it, it's going to absorb water or another liquid, and it'll swell. That's how it thickens. How the, the thickening agent will make a thick molecular mesh that traps water, and Michael could definitely explain that much better than I will. And setting, that's the effect of temperature. If you're using gelatin, of course, it's going to set when you chill it. Now, we're going to start by showing you some thickening agents um, in work. So the first one I'm going to use is blood. So if you're familiar with kakovan, traditionally it was thickened with blood. There's a, quite a few dishes in the French culinary repertoire that were thickened with blood. And believe it or not, you can buy blood. So. When you're adding blood, and I'll show you with a liaison as well, you, with, with blood you add vinegar, and we had a great discussion earlier about what relief that does. So you add a little bit of vinegar to the blood, and it does stop it from coagulating. Just a drop. And another important feature when you're using blood, you want to temper it. So tempering it is just, you don't want to shock it going into a hot sauce. I'm just going to take a little bit of the sauce and temper it here. I might just add a little bit more blood, why not? A 
and many cultures today still use, I mean, you might tell from my accent that uh, I come from across the pond and we use blood sausage all the time for breakfast. So blood is still a part of, of dining in Ireland. So what you want to do is, like you're doing a Monte Obera, I just gently fold in the blood. Does it look gross? <laughs> now, do you notice what's happening? The color is changing, right? And I can see a thickening here. So I will show you, I'm just heating it a tiny bit more. You don't want it to go over 180 degrees or you will have scrambled blood. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually gives to this dish a very rich complex. Sometimes it could be a little metallic and you can see if you can do you see the color? And that's pretty thick. And it's very rich. And kokovan is a very rich dish. Um, when you eat it, it's a nice winter dish. And that is kokovan thickened with blood. And we can finish it with some, <laughs> some parsley. <laughs> Now that's a beautiful, look at the shine on that sauce. It's really nice. So the next um, thickener is, was used also in classic French cuisine, and it's called a liaison. And um, a liaison, basically, two things coming together, right? And we have egg yolks. And cream. Now egg yolks are the same. They go over 180 degrees, you're going to have scrambled, and it's sauce with a really lumpy texture. Okay. Now. So you're familiar with um, a sauce called a velouté? So a velouté, no, so a velouté is a velvet sauce, and it gets its name from a liaison. And a lot of restaurants that say they serve a velouté, really, it's not a velouté. So, but uh, they, you, it's very difficult to get that texture without, um, where's the cream? Oh yeah, without using a liaison. And, it can, and what makes this difficult to do when you're cooking is that it can only be done last minute. That means when the sauce is ready to be served, you put the liaison on and it goes out. You can't reheat it, it's gonna turn into scrambled eggs. And it gives a very, very unique texture. So, thanks, Alex. So yet again, I'm going to just temper the liaison a little bit with some of the. This is just chicken stock with um, a, a very small roux, not a full roux that would thicken it. So. Now it should take on a velvety appearance. If you look at velvet clothing, this is exactly what this will do. And it makes it for a very different mouthfeel. And it's very rich. Quite delicious, too. Now, I can feel that sauce is after thickening. And if you can see, right? We don't have scrambled eggs. That's a good thing. <laughs> and that is cocovan and a velouté. And I'm going to pass you down to Alex, and Alex is going to show you two more thickening. And Alex is going to demonstrate arrowroot and cornstarch as a thickening agent. Yep. Yep. Hello, Alex. everyone. I'm going to uh, talk about two more starches, uh, arrowroot and cornstarch. And I'm going to make uh, two simple sauces that we all can do. Um, the first, the first uh, sauce I'm going to make is uh, 
simple sweet and sour sauce. And I'm going to use cornstarch. Cornstarch is a starch from corn. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it has a strong flavor. Um, it leaves an opaque color. Um, it's, it's not the, the perfect starch to use for a clear finishing product. But for a lot of Asian dishes, uh, the cornstarch is good for um, hot, cold, sweet, savory dishes. And it's pretty universal. It, the, 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 the cons to using cornstarch is that it doesn't recover from being frozen. And the flavor, if you use too much, the flavor is strong. But the positive side of cornstarch is gluten-free. And you know, with all the allergens going on in, in the world today, this is a good alternative. So simple. We add all the ingredients. A cup of soy. Three tablespoons of sugar. Cup of rice wine vinegar. And about a half a cup of ketchup. So to use cornstarch as a thickener, you have to make what's called a slurry. And a slurry is basically equal parts flour and water to a, a thick liquefied paste. And the reason why you make a slurry is that if you add the cornstarch straight to the sauce, you would have clumps and lumps of uh, little, little pillows of uh, cornstarch that won't blend properly. So I'll whisk, just make sure everything is incorporated, and I'll start the slurry. All right, that's not fast. A little more. Okay, so you mix the water and the cornstarch together, you have your slurry. And when the sauce is up to a boil, is the, is the perfect time to add the slurry. And the sauce definitely needs to be boiling. It needs to be above 180 degrees. And the slurry needs to start with cold water. You can't start with hot water because it will definitely do something different to the thickening where it will premature thicken the uh, slurry but not thicken the sauce. And you'll have a broken, broken sauce Put this here? Yep. Oh, and then I'll just add the... Pineapple juice? Pineapple juice. Okay. It smells good from here. What did you just add in? Just a little pineapple juice. Oh, that was pineapple juice. Yeah. See, I'm counting volume fraction. <laughs> no, no, you guys are watching him cook, and I'm counting volume fraction. So he put, how much water did you put in there? In the slurry? It was 50-50? Uh, it, it was about 50. a half a cup. A half a cup of water? And there's much more than a cup of the, the sauce. I mean, this is a couple cups of sauce, isn't it? It is a couple of cups of sauce. In, actu in actuality, I'm probably not going to need all of the slurry. Right. So it's going to expand. Again, you see what I mean? You want to add slowly. Stir. And as you can see, the color has changed. That's pretty thick. And that's thick. Did you see that? Yeah. I mean, I know you've thickened sauces before, but it's amazing. Like, you just put in a little of that stuff, and it got that much thicker. So here I'm going to make... Uh, 
a blueberry compote, which would basically be like a dessert sauce, or could be, uh, could be used as a pie filling. And I'm going to thicken this sauce with arrowroot. And the reason why I'm using arrowroot, because arrowroot has, one, a neutral flavor. So when you're using our fruit, it's, it's best to have a neutral flavor, something not that's going to overpower the fruit. So I have some frozen blueberries, some orange juice. And just like the cornstarch, I'm going to make a slurry with the arrow. Let's go. So arrowroot is a is a plant from the Caribbean, and it has a very strong holding power, four times as much as flour, and it is a, it's a very uh, very good good choice, for, for, like I said, for a fruit dish, or and it's also gluten free. But here it is again, the slurry but the same consistency. The blueberries are coming to a boil. And I'm gonna slowly add. The reason why I slowly add is because as the, as, as the uh, sauce thickens, <clears throat> Sometimes the stages take longer or shorter, and I just don't want to go over or go, go less, so I'm just going to add slow. And as you can see, it's really thickening up, mm -hmm. depending on what you're going to use it for. Right now, if I was going to nappe this sauce over a pastry or a cake, I would stop here. If I was going to use this as a pie filling, I would go a little bit more. And then I'll go one more as if we're going to fill this. Mm. Thanks, Alex. Well, that, that concludes the, uh, the cornstarch and arrowroot. Awesome. So, I'm going to pass it to Luis. Luis is going to demonstrate. Thanks, Alex. You're welcome. Luis is going to demonstrate a, a roux as a thickening agent, and while he's doing that, you're going to taste what he's making, and that's New England clam chowder that's served here for the undergraduate students every Friday. <laughs> so we have a sampling coming out, and um, Luis added butter, right? Add um, frosted vegetables, um, add in celery, and then I'm going to add onions to it. Let it cook for a little bit. Louise, how many gallons of chowder do you make every Thursday for Friday? Average around about 100 gallons. So 100 gallons of chowder, that's and quite chowder. a lot of chowder. It's a quite a lot of chowder, yes. I think you need a bigger pot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm basically I'm sweating the vegetables. Now I'm going to add the butter. Bacon, Louis? Yeah, I'm adding the bacon. And I'm adding the bacon. Just add the flour. So you can see it's. So he, what Luis is doing, he's making a, a white roux, and it's that's even amount of flour and, and butter. 
So there's a white roux, a blonde roux, and then there's a dark roux, and the dark roux is used if you're making an uh, etouffee down in Louisiana, nice dark. I'm adding the cream. There's more cheddar, Krista has it right here. A lot of bay leaves. A little bit of thyme. It's doing its things, it's getting thick and beautiful, nice color. I'm gonna add the potatoes. And at least the last is uh, the clams. Salt and pepper for flavor. And the clam shell is done. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. So the next one we're going to show you is um, xanthan gum. And xanthan gum is in a lot of foods that you, that you eat because it is a stabilizer and, and a thickener. So do you ever make tuna salad and you, you go to the tuna salad, you know, maybe two hours later and there's kind of milk coming off the tuna salad, right? The mayonnaise has turned milky. So we've got some white tuna meat, some blanched celery. Oops. Some mayonnaise. lemon juice. A little bit of salt and pepper. And that's tuna salad, right? But that tuna salad is not going to stay like that. If you were making that for tomorrow, you're going to have, um, it'll break down a bit. The mayonnaise will break down. The water from the tuna will start coming out because it's in cans full of water or pouches. And xanthan gum doesn't take a lot. A little bit of xanthan gum will keep that. Doesn't taste, doesn't interfere with the taste of the product. But this will still look like this tomorrow. So that's it? That's all it takes? That's all it takes. And xanthan gum is used in a cold application. Xanthan gum can be used to thicken dressings, uh, oils. So you've got to think of cold for xanthan gum. So does anybody know what it's doing? I mean, there wasn't very much xanthan gum. It doesn't need much, yeah. So I, I mean, presumably the xanthan gum is a polymer. And presumably as such, it's making a gel in the water and thus trapping the water and not letting it out. And I mean, what's amazing is that such a small amount, I mean, yeah. you barely put any in. Mm -hmm. Just a little spring, a little pinch. Does anybody know where xanthan gum comes from? This is like the quiz night. Bacteria. Bacteria. Yep. Okay, so anyway. one more, and I'm going to show you an emulsion. So, and I'm going to just do this so you can actually see what, that's just some shallots, right? Some Dijon mustard. Should be over here, right? Um, and vinegar, you know, we normally do like three to one, something like that. Now, you can see that this is separated. It's really not doing a whole lot, but just by putting an immersion blender in. salt and pepper, and you've got a nice dressing, and it's rice wine vinegar, Dijon, um, and olive oil. But it, that could be any vinegar you like, and 
you could go to a milder oil like a canola oil. But that has the consistency of a thick sauce. Will it separate? It, it does tend to. When you make it, you do need to. Um, it won't fully separate like an Italian dressing, but just before you use it, you can just blend it or whisk it. Does anybody know why before I put it under the microscope? Does anybody know? Okay, well, the mustard is important for this. Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, wait, you're getting ahead of us, but do you, does anybody, do you know what we're going to see? Let's see if this works. I shouldn't. Isn't that amazing? They're droplets. So what Martin has done, and, and I mean, I think this is really amazing. So sorry, I, I mean, you, you've seen this before. Probably you've done this yourself. But you saw what he did. He poured in some oil. Um, he poured in some vinegar. He put in a little bit of mustard. There was the oil separated from the vinegar. And then he just blended it. And look at all the little droplets that he made. Thanks, guys.